Away you go. Away I go. So where's my phone? Here's my phone. Does anyone remember the open moco? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They haven't got an open moco. Not so many. They, they sold, I don't know, a few thousand, I think, and there was a lot of buzz, but it kind of fell flat, you might remember. There was a few hardware bugs, and the software never was really good, and a few people used them. I used mine religiously because I wanted to, even though my wife thought I should get another phone because she wanted one that was reliable. Um, but yeah, it was fun. It was fun to play with, but no, it was always a little bit behind the times. There was only 2G um, connectivity, the network data was really slow and all sorts of stuff. Um, and so about, let's see, uh, two, two and a half years ago, um, this group, Gold Delicious, who are not a cheap Chinese phone manufacturer, they're, I don't know, moderate expensive German uh, thing manufacturer, um, decided to try and reboot the whole process and, and create what is now called Open Ph Phoenix Phonix, which has got letters out of the word phone and letters out of the word Linux and joined together. Um, the idea being a phoenix, the bird that comes out of its own ashes, so the ashes of the Open Mojo project is the Open Phoenix project. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you about. I've been spending a bit of time with it over the last 18 months or so. Um, so basically, initially at least, it's, it's a new motherboard for the free runner. So this is an open, for, even though it's the same box I bought, I don't know, three years ago for the open moco, it says Neo on the front, the same battery, um, the same speakers, same aerials, antennas. Um, it's a new motherboard, and you can see, hopefully, the picture of the GTA 04 is a bit dark there, but um, GTA, I think, stood for GSM, touchscreen, accelerometer, I mean, it's an odd collection of, of bits, but um, the thing I noticed when I looked at it is everything seems a little bit smaller in the newer thing, I guess, miniaturization. <laughs> There's also less shielding, I'm not sure if that's important or not. Um, it doesn't seem to be, it seems to work, so, at least mostly. Um, for instance, uh, things were bigger, like in GTA 2, you can see this bit up there, there's a, a module that was added over the, from the 01 to add Wi-Fi, and they added that little Wi-Fi module and there was no more room for stereo speakers. In fact, it's exactly where one of the speakers should go, so the free runner only had one speaker, so you couldn't get a stereo effect when you listen to your music. Not that an inch and a half is enough to give you stereo, I don't think, but anyway. Um, whereas with the 04, that's the Wi-Fi chip there, that's a GPS chip and that's the processor and the big thing at the top is the GSM bit. So everything's a little bit smaller so it's probably a little bit easier to squeeze it in, um, possibly a little bit cheaper to make. Um, here's a picture in, in more detail of what's on the, the motherboard if you're interested. It's got a bunch of sensors, unfortunately there's no blood pressure sensors but there's an air pressure sensor. Um, I was thinking, you know, this, this, this has got lots of sensors in it, but they're none of the ones you want for medicine. Um, so it's got barometer, it's got accelerometer, it's got um, a compass and magnetometer, a gyroscope. Um, it's got FM transmitter and receiver, which haven't actually got working yet, but um, it's got a, a num number of bits and pieces that can be fun. But it basically it's got phone functionality as well. So it's got 3G network connectivity, um, USB 2 rather than the old, which the original one was USB 1. So it's just all, all a little bit better, a little bit faster. Um, an OMAP processor that is about 800 megahertz. Yes, what it's, I think the, some of them go up to a gigahertz. Anyway, so it's just a slightly better motherboard. Um, but it's more than just a motherboard, of course. You, not everybody can get hold of one of the old phones, so you can still occasionally find them on eBay. Um, so we can print our own cases to put them in. Um, I don't think this sort of make, maker technology was around when the free, original free runner was made. Um, but shape, it's at Shapeways, you can sort of send them off a 3D CAD file and they'll send you back a bit of plastic. And, and these are what these photos are. Um, some of them are actually the real plastic, some of them are the, this is like a 3D rendering of what it would look like. You can see a little hole there in the back cover, that's because there is an optional camera. I haven't got one yet. Um, but you can get a little camera to make it like a real phone. Um, but yeah, so obviously these 
uh, pictures you'll see here. They're a different colour than the original, but they're the same basic um, bits of plastic. The, the blue one's uh, one I may actually get, because that's that holds the two internal speakers, and I've only got a different bit of plastic that only holds one internal speaker, and I really want that stereo separation. And I can have it now with the four, so I might get one of those. I don't know. But if you don't, uh, if you don't want the old-fashioned plastic, because we've got all the specs, we know exactly what the sizes are, and uh, we've got all the original diagrams and stuff, people have made their own. Um, and I think uh, the wooden one wasn't entirely made by hand. It was he had a, a drill on a, a maker thing um, program to drill the right shape. But um, I'm not sure that wooden phone is quite. But then the metal one looks a bit big and clunky too. But then these days that looks a bit big and clunky. So I guess. Um, if, you, if I'd made that myself, I would think it was awesome. And that's kind of what it's all about to some extent. It's making things yourself and, and being able to make it yourself. And one of the things the GTO 4, the Open Phoenix gives you is, well, here's a, a bit of a phone. You can do the rest. Um, you can either buy the, the plastic one from Shapeways and choose what material to make it out of or to cut what colour to put it in or, or let your imagination go wild. Um, Unfortunately, I mean, I think making the phones, the really slim phones like your modern Samsungs and so forth, are a bit, maybe a bit beyond us yet, but I would have said those ones were beyond us a few years ago, so who knows. Anyway, where are we at with the uh, Phoenix at the moment? We've had about 300 have been made. Was, um, the first batch was promised, oh, I'm running it, probably about three years ago when there was production, and I eventually got it. Was it one and a half or two and a half years ago? I can't remember now. Probably one and a half years ago. Um, that was like just a, a small batch. I think it was about 60 or so. Um, and they, they did have a few issues, uh, hardware issues, nothing really major. Once the, that had all proved it, um, made another batch of, of a couple of hundred. And this is a quite different approach to selling them than the open mode which they made a whole lot and then tried to sell them. Um, all of these were sold to pre-orders, so you had to pre-order, um, send in your money in advance, wait till enough people had ordered them. Um, I never actually got as many as, as Nicholas Shaler, the guy who works for, who owns um, Golden Delicious and is making them. He, he wanted more, but he decided with the number of orders he, could, he got, yes, we could make it for the price. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been pre-ordered, so it's, there's still a lot of risks, there's a number of boards, you know, didn't, didn't function for various reasons and um, that, so there have been a lot of costs, but hopefully he yeah, didn't have to invest way more money than um, on the hope that people would buy them, because of course when the original Freerunner came out, the iPhone had only just been announced or something, so it was kind of new and different and special. Today, um, your Android phones really have much better functionality, faster processors and stuff. They're just not as open. So really, now the only selling point for this is it is, is open, um, which isn't necessarily going to gain quite as much. It will, maybe it will among us if we can afford it, but not. Anyway, so a lot of people, some people, I don't know how many, I do, use it as a regular phone. I know other people do. Um, and it, it works. I think it works better than the free runner did, but it's so long time, such a long time ago that I was using that. Um, I have a selective memory. Um, the 3D module works. It kind of crashes sometimes, but it's, it's probably document. Maybe it's crashing because I'm sending the wrong commands to it in some way. You know, there's this kind of standard for how to talk to a, a 3D, all these at commands, um, but they're not exactly standard. And how to respond in unusual circumstances, or what all the error codes mean, it's, it's a bit weird. So, but I think we're slowly sort of figuring out what things cause it to break and then stop doing those. It's got an FM radio, which would be cool, because I like listening to classic FM, but I don't have a driver for that yet. It may be possible, it's just like, it's an I2C device and an audio device, and the audio side, driver size should be really easy to do. And then an I2C command, just to send commands to it, should be able to be done from user space, but haven't got that yet. 3D acceleration is, is a closed source blob you get from TI. Um, I don't really care about 3D acceleration much myself, so I've not looked into it. Other bits and pieces. Um, power usage I'll get onto more in later. It's actually not too bad at the moment. Some things happened since I wrote, wrote these slides. Um, 
Oh, my last point there I was going to highlight is say still plenty of room for improvement. One of the areas of improvement is, is the new boards coming out. This is a sales pitch. You should all buy one because that way... You should pre-order one because that way they'll actually go ahead. Um, so this is the A5. I've got the A3. Each A is like slight improvements. The schematics have already been made available. It's kind of finalised. Um, so sensors have been upgraded, not to blood pressure monitors, but the old ones you just can't buy anymore. Um, the turnover is of these bits, as you probably know, is too high to really assume that the same bill of materials will be available a year or two later. Um, some minor components can now be powered off, so they couldn't be powered off before. It's like, you know, who cares, if, you know, there's this, like the, the crystal, the timing crystal, high speed, high frequency crystal, probably draws one or two milliamps. Um, it's, in this it's just left on all the time. But, you know, when you get the power usage down to around 10, 15, 10, 15 milliamps, there's one or two is a significant difference. So he's added some circuitry to, to turn off, try and turn off as much as possible. Um, little things like when I plug a headset in, there's no kind of interrupt. I have to keep polling the detector to see what's plugged in at the moment, so that's been fixed in, in the A5. And, and little bits and pieces like that. Apparently the um, GSM module can now not just interrupt the processor, but can actually turn it on. It's like effectively the same as pressing the power button. Um, it's interesting. To, so if we can get Linux to boot fast enough, obviously with System D, because that makes booting faster, um, get it all to boot fast enough so you can actually answer a phone call within like a s half a second of the process being waked up, then we can get it can, all the rest of the phone can actually be off, not just in suspend or hibernate, but actually off. Um, I'll probably in hibernate, I guess, get it to wake up, resume from from flash. Anyway, so those are just some things to have. And to that last point, the 3D data, the, the shape of the board, not just the shape of it, but the, the profile, how high all the components are, will be available um, as so if, if people want to make their boards, they can be very precise in exactly where to make their own cases, be very precise in exactly where they can and can't put extra plastic. Um, so that's, the, I guess, focusing... Open Phoenix isn't just about the motherboard. I guess that's the main thing. Um, it's the, the heart of it. Um, just like... Uh, open source isn't just about Linux, but this is still linux.conf.au. It's kind of the heart of it. There's a lot of things that build on or contribute to, whichever way you look at it, Open Phoenix. Um, Replicant is kind of, well, they're trying to make it work. And, and Android, there's a very open source Android port. Um, they're having trouble getting a kernel to work because as you probably know, Android kernels have other stuff in it that aren't exactly in mainline. And um, there are, obviously, you can get kernels with all that in it, but they maybe don't work on the OMAP processor very much. I mean, a lot of stuff I've been doing is to get the mainline kernel actually working on the OMAP processor and all the devices. And so I've been doing that on mainline, not on the Android. So you've got kind of two branches a branch of Linux with Android support and a branch of Linux with board support and bringing them together needs time and expertise and nobody has been able to put those together at the moment. So I think the replicant effort is kind of a bit stalled at the moment, though someone is having a bit of a go. SHR is a stable hybrid release, which I think is based on the original OpenMoCo, original code that OpenMoCo did for their release and with other bits plugged in and it's GTK, I think, apps and all sorts of bits and pieces. I don't know, I think it's still alive, I don't hear much from it, maybe that's because it just works and nobody needs to ask questions. And QT Moco is, is one that seems most active on the mailing lists as a, a guy in, in, um, in Czech Republic, I think, who's really driving that and putting out new releases and trying new things. Question up the back? Is there a pre-order link for this new board? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you go to probably gta04.org, yeah. um, you could, should be able to get it from there. There definitely is a pre-order link. Um, or openphoenix.org will probably get you to a similar sort of place. Um, but the one in the middle there is one that I'm interested in, um, our friend Tux. I'm a kernel developer. I've been a kernel developer for a long time now. Um, and I, my interest is getting the kernel, the Linux kernel, the mainline kernel, as much as possible to work well on this board. Um, it originally came with a two 
six thirty something. Sorry, thirty two. Uh, yeah, it was uh, a kernel, oldish kernel with a lot of OMAP stuff added, lots of bits added, pulled in from here and there, and it worked and it was. Um, it could be used, but it was a long way from mainline, and so it was a long way from being interesting for me. One of the things I didn't like about the free runner was that the kernel always seemed to be quite divergent from mainline. That this wasn't the issue, wasn't the effort. Didn't seem to be while well, I was watching at least the effort to kind of synchronise with mainline and push all their drivers up. And I appreciate that there have been issues in the ARM community and the embedded community, and pushing things upstream has not always been easy. And I've been exposed to some of that myself. Um, but that's what I'm really interested in, running a mainline kernel. So what did we need? We needed some new drivers because there's all these sensors and different doohickeys in there that need to be worked. Um, we need to continually fend off bugs. This has kind of been a bit disappointing. I'll talk a bit more about this later. But every new release of the kernel has new bugs that uh, I need to fight off because um, there are so many different devices and they're all different and testing for all of them is not practical. Um, looking where the paths, one of the ongoing frustrations is that it uses too much current. Um, the battery is 120 milliamp hours, 1200 milliamp hours. Um, so at last, uh, well, that's when it's brand new, mine's down to about 1000 or 800 milliamp hours. Um, so you don't want the suspend time current to be much more than about I don't know, is it 30 or something to get it to last from 6 in the morning till midnight or something and just leave it charged overnight. And I'd really like it to last longer than that, but that's kind of a bare minimum. Um, so finding, figuring out how to turn things off and what things need to be turned off is, is tricky. And of course pushing it all upstream, I won't be talking very much about that, but um, it's always fun seeing your patches appear in the mainline kernel and I've, I've had some positive experiences there, so that's good. So what drivers are needed? Well, it's got, um, let's go through this quickly, there's a LED driver, so it's got two LEDs. Uh, that's one disappointment. The original free run had a blue LED, and this has only got green and red. I mean, that's just so <laughs> ordinary. But um, the LED, do they? That's probably the problem. Anyway, the, the LED driver can blink the flash blink the LEDs in hardware so you can tell it uh, an on time and an off time and it'll do the blinking so you can have the LEDs blinking saying I've got a new message or something while the CPU is in suspend it's not doing anything so that's, that's a good thing um, and there's a really nice uh, subsystem that's the word for LEDs in kernel which you can it's really easy to write a driver for any bit of hardware it just plugs into the LED subsystem it just works so writing the LED driver was, it was just it was nice it was fun it was easy it, it there was no struggle it was a case of read the docs look at the interface plug them together done um, so that was the first biggish bit of code out of this effort that went in apart from little bug fixes um, then there's the accelerometer that's a very different kettle of fish because what is an accelerometer? Traditionally, like in the Freerunner and others, it's kind of an I.O. device because it's providing input from the outside, so it's an input device. But the I.O. the input, so it's an input, using the input the uh, subsystem, the same as keyboards and mice and joysticks and, and various other things. But the um, input maintainer didn't like that idea, um, and for good reason, because the input mod subsystem is really for input from people, you no know, human input. Um, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to say something to you. And the accelerometer, and so it's, it's usually events that the user, in, user generates. You know, a mouse that's sitting still doesn't generate any events. As you move the mouse, as you do a deliberate action, it causes events to go in. And, and that, that fits, it's a nice model. And whereas an accelerometer is just span, spitting out um, X, Y, Z acceleration values constantly. And so it's, it's a very different sort of thing. Um, and he has let some drivers come in for the, the accelerometer drivers for the input model, the input subsystem, but doesn't like it. Um, the alternative is this IIO thing, industrial IO, which is relatively new. It, it was in staging for a few releases. It is in mainline. In, it's out of staging now. Um, it, I'm not sure it's exactly a perfect fit either. It, it feels kind of clumsy to me. I, I know there's lots of configuration. Then maybe you need lots of configuration. There's options to, to um, so there's files and sysfs which you can 
try and set the data rate and set the range, maximum range, and, and set our various other things. I can't remember them all. Um, it seems too complex, but that's probably where accelerometers... I mean, and the accelerometer really does fit in both areas because it does generate this constant stream of data like I.O. device, but... Um, most sort of new accelerometers can ha have hardware to, de to detect taps and to detect an inversion, right? So it can generate an interrupt when I do that, or it can generate an interrupt when I do that, which is different from what happens when I do that, right? And these, these are user inputs, right? The stream of, of data that can just tell exactly where my phone is isn't really, but that clearly is. So it's likely you want to have two different drivers for it. And exactly resolving that, I haven't. It's one thing I really want to do. I'm not actually using the accelerometer on this at the moment, because I don't have a proper driver, but figuring out exactly how it should work. And then there's air pressure and magnetometer and gyroscope, and they're all, they all fit. So we've got drivers for some of those. I think we've got drivers for all of them, but they're not all IAO drivers. Some of them are MISC drivers. Um, and other stuff there. The backlight is, is just, I'll mention briefly. Um, because it's one of the things I wanted to work, I looked around, I found a driver that wasn't in mainline. The reason it wasn't in mainline was because it used some legacy interface, but there was no new subsystem. There was not yet a PWM, that's pulse width modulator, um, which is how, how it sets the brightness of the backlight. And so I kind of had to wait a while until the PWN subsystem got completed, got merged. And then, once again, like with the LEDs, I could write a nice little module. I had the, exactly the right interface and exactly the right specs, and it, it just worked. So, you know, getting these subsystems into Linux, which allows you to write the drivers, is so important, and it is slowly happening. Um, and headsets. So there's lots of, lots of different driver things that are, that are needed. Um, and where we are with the drivers is most of this have drivers. So I said the radio doesn't, the, the IRDA, the infrared doesn't, but who uses IRDA these days? Is it you do? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> A few people. <laughs> well, no, so you, universal remotes aren't IRDA. They're oh, C I R. They're 40 mega. Um, 40 megahertz. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a different standard. This probably can do, well, the OMAP processor module can do consumer IR, but it's not wired up properly to do it at the moment. So if we were to do that, we'd need to use, just drive like a GPIO bit banger, which might be possible. Um, so that's something I probably will look at. The, the IR that comes out there, the same place as one of the LEDs. So bugs. You'd think, you know, you upgrade from one kernel to the next, and it would all just keep working. Because well, been using the Linux kernel for a while. No, but, but Linux doesn't allow regressions. He says so. Not allowed to regress. Um, so starting at 3.2, I basically I, I I first got this working on a 3.2 RC and got it. So 3.2 was kind of working, and then 3.3 and 3.4 and 3.5 I, I upgraded each time. And each time I hit bugs. I don't remember what they all were. I'd probably find in my git logs if I really wanted to. I skipped 3.6, so there's, my last jump was from 3.5 to 3.7. And I thought I'd just sort of quickly go through the bugs that I hit. Um, and they're kind of all over the place. Um, so the Wi-Fi chip in this is connected via SDIO, SD as in SD card. So it's like a, there's two MMC, I don't quite follow all these acronyms, but there's two MMC interfaces, one for the internal SD, micro SD card, and one for the Wi-Fi. And uh, the SDIO driver wouldn't suspend. It would, so you, you go suspend and the SDI drives, oh, something's wrong. And um, this is actually something I fixed earlier. It's really weird. So Raphael, uh, the power, power management guy, made a change to power management, which is incredibly complex. Even once you understand it, it's still complex. Um, and which was a sensible change, but SDIO was doing something kind of weird that didn't work together. So it caused this problem again, and I talked to him about it, and we fixed it. And that was all good, but then somebody did some code cleanup and ended up exactly reverting his fix because the fix looked wrong. Because it kind of did, because the code's so complex. But anyway, I got that read. Then we could suspend, but 
Now when it resumes, you can't find the Wi-Fi anymore. So this is a different problem, a completely different problem. The way the way it, the SDIO works is it says, well, when I'm going to suspend, I can do one of two things. I can actually tell the driver to suspend and let that work, or I can just pretend it's unplugged. Because, you know, it's, an interface, it's a, an interface you're allowed to unplug things from and plug things back in again, so that should be fine. Um, the Wi-Fi driver, when, it go, when you ask to suspend, it says, well, look, nobody's configured me for wake on, wake on Wi-Fi, so there's no point really suspending. I may as well just be unplugged. There's no point. So it says fail. This is what was causing the problem before, in a way. The suspend routine says fail. And so the SDIO driver says, oh, he can't suspend. It's all right. I'll just turn him off. Not a problem. Um, the only way to turn it back on again if you just do a rescan, if you have to rescan the bus on resume. And so it was rescanning the bus on resume, which is a bit ugly, but it worked. Anyway, somebody decided that devices that were marked not removable, and the Wi Fi is reasonably marked not removable, there's no point rescanning for them, which sounds to be true, except it's inconsistent with this other principle that's in the SDIO driver. So it's, it's kind of it's complicated. People don't really un see, understand the whole picture. I, I, get, I get this feeling a lot. And I'm sure it's true of myself too. People don't understand the whole picture and they make changes and break things. And that's what happened. He made a change, somebody made a change. It seemed like a really reasonable change and it broke. Um, so currently I've just reverted that. I'd really like to get the driver to suspend properly because I don't want it to keep rescanning on every resume. It's pointless. Another question? Two actually. Two Is questions. Is still the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi in one? Yeah, so Bluetooth and Wi-Fi in, in the one chip. Does yep. it still require the um, binary firmware? Yes, there is the... We don't have source for the firmware that we load into it. That's right. A little bit open is better than not available, is my theory. Um, yeah, and then it does has this next point. It has to load some firmware, like a lot of chips do. And somebody had async firmware loading, which sounds like a good idea, and it just didn't work for me. And I sent him an email saying it doesn't work for me. And usually I wouldn't send an email to maintainers, like, it's, it's really helpful. I just never got a reply from him. Maybe I went to his spam folder, I don't know. Um, but just totally kind of really kind of independent things all broke around Wi Fi. And then this is, this is really amusing. Um, Upgrade 3.7 and the image on the screen got this little green tinge. At first I thought I must be imagining it, but somebody else tried the same kernel and he complained, why is it all so green? Um, and I, I had no idea. I eventually had to do a git bisect, which is kind of difficult because I've got this old extra stuff added to it, and so I had to um, kind of strip that, strip the extra stuff I had down to just the minimum to get it to boot, turn on the backlight and show the display. But mainly we get bisect and I found this really obscure patch where it was actually a really good, a positive patch was cleaning up. There's lots of places in the code where it has this, things like CPU is omat 34 xx or CPU, if CPU is this, do that funny thing, else if CPU is that, do that funny thing. Um, which is really hard to read. And so what this patch was doing was Factoring some of that out and introduce some data structures with this feature flags, feature DPI uses VDDS DSI, which probably means something to somebody. Um, which it, it tends to make sense instead of having all these tests: is it no map this or no map that or the no map other? Says if it's if it has this feature, do this, which probably makes the code a lot more readable. It's a really good idea, but somehow, you know, in the translation they got it wrong because this phone is both a 34XX and a 3360. One must be a subclass of the other, I think. The fact that it's actually a, a 37 something something in there is beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love the names? Um, anyway. So, got that fixed, but it's, it's just, you know, it's really obscure bug, it's so hard, lots of git bisecting and it's fine, it's, you know, one line fix. Um, the GPIO interrupt, so when you touch the screen it toggles the GPIO which interrupts the processor and so it can measure where you're putting your finger, right? Um, obviously you don't want that GPIO active when the machine's suspended, otherwise it'll keep waking up whenever it bumps it against me in my pocket. Um, but there was somebody rewrote the GPIO code and obviously wasn't thinking about that properly. Um, I, I'd actually fixed that before and they, 
I said I'd, I'd actually fixed that in a previous release, and I sent the fix upstream, and the guide said yes, all in favour, we'll apply that, and it disappeared. <laughs> um, another one of these, it's 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 too complex for people to really understand, I think, and I feel I feel this is a important role for Linux Weekly News to really document it all, so that more people can understand it. Um, but the USB is kind of complex because there's a driver for the physical interface, the PHY, and a driver for the kind of more logical interface, and they need to talk to each other so they both agree they know whether something's plugged in or whether it's in client widget mode or host mode and, and that sort of stuff. And there was this, there's a, a, an event, a... It wasn't called events. It's a, a, a way of signalling between devices that you know a, one device can register with another device to say, "Tell me when things happen," um, and it, it was all notifications, um, and you know, notification thing. And somebody replaced it with this new and better mailboxes. And I've got no idea what a mailbox is except the one in my front yard. Um, but it, it's presumably better. I'm perfectly willing to believe it's better. But of, of the different bits in the USB system that need to talk to each other, the charger hadn't been upgraded. And you know, the, you wouldn't think charge is part of USB, but the way I charge my phone is I plug the USB port in. So when, when the USB notices it's being plugged in, it notifies the charger, so the charger module can think, oh, is there current? There's current now, I can turn on the battery charger thing. Um, we obviously are connected, but somebody broke that, so I found it just wasn't charging anymore. <laughs> and this last one is really sad. because So the BQ27000 is inside the battery, and it measures how many electrons are going back and forth, or how many holes are going in the other direction, I'm not sure. And it keeps track of what the charge is, which is all good. And there's, that uses a one-wire interface. There are other slightly different versions that use I2C interfaces and so forth. So there's a few different BQ27Xs. And somebody added support for the BQ27425. And if you look at the code, it's just it, nobody had reviewed the code. I'm sure no one had reviewed. He hadn't read it himself because um, <laughs> it, it added a line somewhere that said, you know, if it's... Something like set type equals BQ27425, and then if type, it's like he'd put in for debugging and never removed it. I don't know, it's just like a two line fix, but it took me. Well, that one didn't take me too long to find because it was kind of a recent change, it was pretty obvious. Um, so what's the big picture we learned from kernel bugs looking? It just, it just keeps happening. Um, it was different bugs from 3 to 2 to 3 and 3 to 4, and some of them recurring, which is really sad. Um, but there's always new ones, and it's just, it's just complex. The Linux kernel is actually... Now, that shouldn't scare you off. It's fun. There's a lot to learn. There is really a lot to learn. Um, but... And the introduction of these things like the subsystems, the LED subsystem, the, the PWM subsystem, the new stuff we've been reading about, the GPIO subsystem, they're really good. Make it so much easier to write drivers and consequently so much harder to write bugs. Not impossible, but harder. So, so um, it's good to see that happening, but um, something I think, I personally think the power management subsystem is, is too complex and needs to be kind of really deeply rethought and rewritten. Um, but, but having spoken to, to Raphael about it a bit, it's actually really difficult to get a, get something that works with on a thing like that, which has no firmware support for power management, and also to work with um, what's the firmware power management on P ACPI. ACPI, yeah, and also works with ACPI, which imposes its own rules and and still makes sense. It's actually it's not an easy problem. But currently, it's not a good solution. Um, but yeah, regular testing seems to be the only answer. Basically, I really want to do every release as it comes out so I can catch just the two or three bugs at a time and hopefully get them fixed upstream um, rather than having too many at once. And of course, when I have to go to a, a Git bisect, the smaller range I can do it through, the better. So upgrading at each release. And so the other reason I want to have more people with these, so more testing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, the code is definitely getting better. As I said, a number of those bugs happened due to patches that were really making improvements. Um, I don't want to stay on the old version. The new version really is better. It has new file systems and new network protocols and, and all sorts of stuff. But um, 
it's it's a struggle. It's an ongoing issue. And I expect it's not just me. I expect you know the Android developers are facing the same thing, and that's why a lot of people are probably kind of stuck on slightly older kernels because it's a struggle to upgrade sometimes. Okay, what about power? The thing about power, I was thinking about this is kind of like security. It's not one driver. It's a whole system thing. Um, it's very hard to. You know, if, if, if there's a green tinge, at least I know it's in the display subsystem that there's a problem, right? If, if I'm hearing crackles from the sound, it's, it's somewhere else. But if the power's not working, it's not the battery's fault. It's not the regulator's fault. It's, it's somewhere something isn't doing the right thing. Um, now, there's, there's a school of thought that says we shouldn't actually need to use suspend to save power. We should just have runtime management sort of bring everything down to a low state and and uh, well, I think it would be nice. I actually think that's probably impractical in practice. <laughs> uh, not actually, not actually practical. Very s kind of ideal and be nice. I'm not sure we could make it work. Um, so I'm not actually focusing on that. If somebody else would like to. That would be great. I'm sure it'd be good stuff there. But so what? It's my my goal is pretty much entirely what can the power usage be in suspend because most of the time my phone is asleep. I accept the GSM module that I can't control anyway. Um, so the goal, I, and I don't know what really to aim for, I'm not the hardware geek particularly, um, I, can, I know what a volt and a milliamp you are roughly. Um, but I, I understand that the GSM module by itself, when there's good signal coverage, shouldn't use more than two, three, maybe four milliamps at four volts on average. Um, if you're in a bad coverage area, it tends to go up because it's shouting more, come and talk to me. But in the city, it should be around about that. And everything else shouldn't really, most of it's turned off, it shouldn't really be using that much more than about the same. It might be a little bit optimistic, I don't know. Where are we at? Well, when I wrote these slows, we were at about 20. Now it's more like 15, because I finally figured out something that I've been working on for a while. But how does how does one get there? What are the I want to sort of go through some of the struggles. And I was think early on thinking, well how can how can I approach this problem? How can I narrow it down? I can't put in printers and stuff. You know, what's what can I make? So I, I said set on the map this what would be really good if we had an infrared photo of the thing while it's in suspend. And we could see where the, the hot bits were and the cold bits were, wouldn't because you know anything that's using current is going to generate heat. It's the law of thermodynamics that promises that. And so you should be able to see it. Um, and one of the guys in Germany, and actually the works for or with the company that made the thing, he's no, he must work for someone else as well at least. And um, he had access to an uh, infrared camera thingy. And so he took some photos for me. I've just selected two. The first one on top left is kind of when it's on, and you can see you can see the the option GSM bit on the left is is dark blue because it's all metal shielded, so the heat's all spread out and and you don't get to see much of the heat. The hot bits is the the big square here is the OMAP process. The little square up to the left of it is is kind of the the, the everything else chip. It's it's. Either called a TWL4030, that's the driver in Linux, or it's called a TPS3 something 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 something, which I'll never remember. I don't know why there are two different part numbers, but it um, it does the audio, so it's got the DAX and ADC to do sound. It does the USB 5, the port out here. It does real time clock. It does the power battery charging. It does the regulators for all the power, almost all the power supplies. Um, it, it's got a couple of GPOs we don't use. It does four or five or six other things that I can't remember. It's kind of the everything else chip for a mobile phone, I think. So it's it's using most of the rest of the power. Um, and so that's just to give you a picture of what it looks like. We ha he got it, he, he tried turning it on, putting it in suspend for a while and then getting a photo of it and getting a photo as it turned on. And that's this one and it's, it's all the same colour just about, which is I was hoping something would stand out, but nothing really does except this little thing up here which happens to be the RS-232 driver. Um, as you might know, RS-232 works with like 12 volts and everything else there is around 3.5 volts or 1.8 volts. So it's got a little charge pump in it to, to create the extra voltage. And the result, the thing is when you actually have an RS-232 cable plugged in, it's actually doing all that and it's burning, I think it's burning about 5 milliamps. 
um, when you unplug it, it goes away. And of course, when I'm using it, it's unplugged. But I was doing all my testing at this stage with the serial cable plugged in so I could see what was happening. So as soon as I stopped testing, the current usage went down, which is it's kind of good, that, but it <laughs> wasn't really a big step. So, but unfortunately, it doesn't really show us anything else. Um, so where else? Yeah, so the RS-232 draws current whenever it's plugged in. Obviously, you've got to make sure the doobies in there are turned off. Turning GPS off, obvious thing to do, not actually all that easy. Um, this is kind of a rant, maybe more than anything useful, but the GPS has got a pin, one of those little pins on it. You can use different voltage levels. It's an on-off pin, but it's not exactly an on-off pin. It's an on-off pin. So you pull the line down and up again, and it changes from being on to off, or from off to on. So if it's on, if you know it's on, it's easy to turn it off. If you know it's off, it's easy to turn it on. If you don't know what state it's in, then you don't really know what to do. And it seemed to come up in a random state at power on, or at least after reboot. Um, I'm not sure if maybe the line was a bit. I'm not. Don't know. It shouldn't really be random, but the evidence was that it seemed to be. Um, the only way you can know, actually know if it's turned on is it's got a serial port, um, RS, not RS232, but UART, so TXRX. So you can watch it sending characters to you because it sends you something, a message every every second. So the original proposal was just right, we'll use the space code that listens on their TDY, whatever, and if there's anything coming, then toggle the line until things stop coming. But being a hard kernel geek and being, I wanted to make, I wanted to make it you know, much more reliable and some little user space program. Um, so I've actually got a driver in there that, so in, on the OMAP3, like most systems on a chips, you can re, reprogram a lot of the pins to do various different things. So I reprogrammed the RX pin for the UART to be a GPIO, so I can get an interrupt whenever it changes. So when, when I want it to be turned off, I reprogram it to be a GPIO, if I get any interrupts, I toggle it and then wait at least a second before trying again. And that, that's effective, it's kind of ugly, but it's effective and effective is important. Um, the other side of that is though, what is the user space side of the question? How does user space say turn on or turn off? The, the GPS and the original original sample kernel just you can have GPOs controlled through SysFS and the suggestion was just you know do something to SysFS um, which I didn't like either so um, the natural kind of the natural way of turning something like this on or off is with the DT, DTR line so it's being like RS232 there should be a data terminal ready line that can go up or down and so, but OMAP UART don't have a DTR line, so I sort of wrote code to make a virtual DTR line. So basically what happens now is when I open dev TTY01, I think it is, um, the OMAP, the code that tries to raise DTR kind of gets converted to the driver which um, knows to toggle this line. And it, it all becomes transparent if it all works, but it's a bit clumsy, a bit ugly. Um, Bluetooth is is really just another serial port. So they've actually turned out to be once once I've got virtual virtual DTR lines that are, when you open Dev TTY, the, a signal goes to the right drive, and when you close it, the same signal Bluetooth was just as easy. Um, use RF kill. RF kill is what I was always imagine RF kill was for transmitting, but there's an RF kill to turn off GPS which I thought was a bit strange, but anyway, you, so GPS has got power to the actual GPS chip and power to the antenna, because it needs a powered antenna. So we use RF kill to turn on. So, and the gyroscope, um, which we didn't have a driver for for a long time, this can tell how fast I'm turning it. Um, it powers on in full power mode using two or three milliamps. And so once I wrote a driver, which suspended it properly, it saved a few more money apps. Um, one day I'd, I'd recently turned the volume up. I'd, I'd, I'd playing, you, know, you don't want the volume too high or you get horrible echo issues, even though you've got some echo cancellation. Um, I turned the volume up and I noticed while it was suspended, I could actually hear a crack of sort of white noise from it. So I did the research and found that if I turn everything off in the sound chip, um, the power usage goes down about five milliamps, um, which I thought was was good. I think what was happening there is there is the audio subsystem has DPMS dynamic no DAPM dynamic audio power management, um, but the way it works is if there's any path that audio can follow, 
then things will stay on. And like with most phones, there's a side chat, a side tone is it called. So when you what you're saying here comes out there, significantly attenuated, but it still comes out so because it's uh, makes people feel better. Um, it feels like you're talking to something and not to a blank wall. And so muting all of that, suddenly it all turned out. So a lot of those tricks for the um, tricks that you need to, that are hard to find out. You know, it was kind of lucky that I heard, I turned the volume up and heard it one day and, and then I could put two and two together and find out what the situation was. Most recent change is a single off mode. So the OMAP processor, each, it's got lots of little modules inside the OMAP system on a chip and each one can be active or not active or in retention mode or off. And retention mode is kind of a, a low power mode where it still actually restores, still actually holds on, retains the valuable registers. And off mode is a lower power mode, hopefully not using any power, where it doesn't restore, doesn't retain the value of all the registers. And so as you can imagine, going, going down to retention mode isn't too hard because you can just come back up again. You've got to kind of turn off clocks and stuff, but there's a lot of mechanism for turning off to on and off clocks and that's all fine. Going down into off mode is tricky because you lose everything. And so when you come back from off mode, you've got to put everything back in. Um, and so for whatever reason, and off mode was not enabled by default. A lot of code was there to support it, but it wasn't enabled by default. As we've discovered, things that aren't tested get broken, and that's what I found. Um, stuff, most stuff worked, but bits and pieces here and there didn't work, and so it's the case of like it goes into off mode, comes back, and oh, the network's not. I can't. I usually I use networking over USB to talk to it, and that didn't work. And at first, the display wouldn't come back on. It was because the backlight wasn't working, but the display wouldn't come back on. Maybe the whole thing's frozen. Fortunately, I've got a serial port, so I can actually... In fact, with the display off and the USB off, you need to have that serial port plugged in or um, you don't actually know that anything's working at all. But again, this is a case of hunting through the code and, and scratching my head and um, eventually getting a hang, hang of what, what the code looks like for saving and restoring registers. Um, the one of them, again, one of them, the external USB, in order to fix it, I reverted a patch that someone had applied about a year ago. It seemed to them like a good idea at the time, but it wasn't. Um, they didn't have the right hardware to test it on. I mean, he's, I've met him, he's a nice guy, I'm sure he tested it on his suite of five different boards, but none of them actually maybe used that particular feature. I don't know. Um, yeah, and so with, with that, with off mode, once it goes into off mode, the OMAP processor tells that everything else chip that it can turn off, and it can turn off a bunch more extra regulators. When it, regulators are turned off, they stop leaking, apparently. I don't know much about why they leak, but I read that they do, so they must. Um, and so that reduces power management. And that, that saved another five or six milliamps, and depending on how lucky you are, you get down to about 15. And 15 milliamps background current on a 1200 milliamp battery, assuming you've got a brand new battery, is looking at what, just under 100 hours, what's probably 80 hours or something, um, which is several days. So I, mean, I haven't ever had that actually work that long, because I don't leave it alone for that long, partly. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of a more reasonable sort of time. And maybe it's start, time to start looking at how much power is used when it's awake and making sure it's getting, because various bits should be able to be turned into off mode if they're not in use, and I'm not really sure that they are. I think off mode currently only affects the spend, but I'm not sure. But anyway, there's more room to explore. Always more room to explore. But what else is Open Phoenix doing? It's got this replacement motherboard for my phone. Um, uh, Nicholas Nicholas Shaler, the guy who's driving this, driving the hardware side of it, is, is full of ideas and wants to do interesting things, which is good. This is a 7-inch um, a tablet. So what we have here is the motherboard out of the GTO 4 motherboard, kind of attached to an, a larger <coughs> expansion board, which I think just has connectors on it. might have a little bit of more interesting electronics, but most of it's connectors. Connected via this cable to a 7-inch display from Sharp or someone off the shelf and a somewhat bigger battery. The reason you need a bigger battery is partly so like you've got room for a bigger battery, you may as well have one, but also 
7 inch display use backlight for 7 inch display creates more light than for a 3.5 inch display I guess 4 times as much light and so it uses 4 times as much current um, and yeah so that is I think he's got a, some sort of box to put that in. There's a video of that one. I, I, so I grabbed that out off a video clip on YouTube. If you go to YouTube, Open Phoenix 7 inch tablet, you'll probably find just what it looks like. But that's another possibility. Maybe a hardware keyboard. Lots of people really want a hardware keyboard. Um, I, yeah, maybe. I, I'm not that fast, but there's probably a place for it. Um, this, this, is, this is an idea that he actually prototyped. So this is, this is the back panel, right? So it's a keyboard that sits on the back of your phone. Um, I'm not sure if you sort of just remember where things are and use it like that, or if you kind of, you know, put it there and with the, you can see the cable and, and tap away. I'm not quite sure. Is it clamshell open? No, it's not clam. No. Like backwards clamshell? No, well, well, not at the moment. The mo it's, it's, uh, it's really very much a prototype. You can see the quality of wires connecting the two things together. Um, the and I don't think that's a DeVore keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> it's whatever you want. Um, the, the new the, the A5, the one he's hopefully going to make in, in the next few months if he gets enough pre orders will have a, a ZIF connector for a keyboard. So instead of having to solder wires onto the test points, and I mean, there's a pitch, there's actually a, an array of like three by about eight, about 20 or 30 test points that you can solder wires onto to get access to extra I2C ports and stuff like that. So you could wire on your, your um, extra heart rate, heart rate monitor devices or something if you wanted to and in fact this kind of one of the early steps in this project was adding a board to the original free runner that added some of those extra sensors that weren't on the original free runner so that's where it kind of started and, and kept growing Sorry to interrupt. Yep. Um, we're at time and but the only thing i've got in, up until after and two is lightning talks now i'm assuming nobody really wants to talk about anything lightning line in a lightning fashion no? All right, well, we'll just continue on until you feel like you... Oh, well, this is my last slide. I was thinking I was, I was pretty going pretty good when you were giving me those timing things. Um, unusual for me. All right. So, um, as, I mean, the, the reason I'm doing this is because there's so much to learn, and there really is a lot for me to learn. I've been learning stuff and, and writing about it for Linux Weekly News occasionally. Um, but there's, it's kind of, you know, my wife's frustrated it's a phone that doesn't work, but in a sense, that's why I like it, because there's things to fix. <laughs> well, the, the texts you should get through a phone calls often do, and I'm learning about adding improving logging so I can, when something goes wrong, I can try and find out why. And I, I, I wrote a lot of the GUI. On my phone, I don't use um, OpenMocha. Oh, QT Mocha or stuff, I wrote stuff in Python GTK and it's because I wanted to and it's... Just like the mechanics now. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't expect anyone else to use any... Uh, use my kernel, don't use any of the other stuff I've written. <laughs> Not for this. Um, but yeah, there's, there's opportunities to learn and opportunities to do stuff. Whether it's in UI or middleware or kernel or case printing. Um, or stuff, and it, they're not cheap. Uh, as I said, it's not a cheap Chinese phone manufacturer. Um, if we could sell, if we could make a hundred thousand of them, and, and we'd probably get the price, you know, quite a lot down. But making twenty thing, two hundred, even two, he's hoping for two hundred. I don't he'll get that, but he's you got to dream big. Two hundred um, things is is still, you know, the setup costs. Um, even though he's donating a lot of his time, I'm sure all the setup costs and stuff. Going to a away soldering place and saying I want to do a run of 50 of 100, you're not going to get as good a unit price if you went and said I want to do 200,000. Um, so the price, so one of the just one of these boards, the new ones, it, it's 555 euro, but that's with the European sales uh, VAT. So if you take off the VAT and add shipping to Australia, it's about 500 euro, um, which is a lot of money. Yes, especially when you've got to pack, get something to, a case to put it in. Um, no doubt about that. But um, might be cheap. You know, the more people do it, the cheaper it is. And 
I, you know, I'm sure that sort of run five years ago would have been a lot more expensive. Things are getting cheaper. I don't know. Questions? Yes, one more, more debate. Um, could you ask the question microphone so it fell on my Would it be possible to boot um, the OpenMoco operating system or the frameworks on a, like a retail phone? Cool. Um, <coughs> yes, I think so. Um, so one of the, one of the key frameworks in the, they use FSO freesmartphone.org and the FSO guys I think started out opening at the OpenMoco but because it didn't kind of go where they started working at looking at other phones as well so they've got their stack working on a number of different phones probably not the one you buy in the shop today because you know it's, everything's so new but um, in principle yes so some of that software certainly could be used on other phones um, but it would be an interesting learning experience to make it work, I'm sure, and that's what we're here for. Um, you mentioned uh, the power management side of things, and from what I know, because I'm not really not very much of a problem, but the power management from the Android kernel board is really the big thing that's keeping it separate from mainline. Do you know much about like, uh, why, why it's such a problem and or, and or if there's a solution in the open market side that the Android people could move to gradually to bring the two together? Okay, so this this so the whole power management thing in Android was was this big hoo ha that a lot of people failing to communicate effectively to each other, not listening to each other, is, is my take of it. It's kind of been resolved, um, except the sh no, except we've got to wait for the smoke to clear. Basically, it's all about getting in into an hour to suspend quickly, and particularly. Um, making sure you stay out of suspend if anything needs to be dealt with. That's a key issue. So open, Android wants to suspend their phone at every possible opportunity and when it wakes up, only keep it awake as long as something really needs it to be awake and then you put it back to sleep again. So you've got to make sure you don't lose events when that's happening. If I press the button, my phone will wake up and then I've got, I've got similar sort of technology because that's technology using the mainline kernel now, though it's a different interface. So. I press the button um, and the kernel and, and the program then means to suspend tries to say suspend straight away and the kernel says no a button's been pressed and it hasn't really been acknowledged and that sort of trickles all the way up to the, the screen lock program that keeps the display awake and it, the screen lock program sort of says stay awake at the moment and then the program that does the suspending says oh I shouldn't suspend after all. So that all happened and my, my phone does work like that, it does suspend. So. In order for this all to be good and for Android to be able to use mainline kernels, basically the Linux power management guys provided the same basic functionality with a completely different interface. And so Android's user space needs to be changed to work with that interface. And I think that's happening because Android guys are adding patches to the kernel and I don't know where it's at though. Uh, yeah, I think that was my main question was, so in the current mainline kernels, there is now a way for user space to say to the kernel, hey, please, please don't go to sleep because I'm the most yeah. important. Yeah, it is. And my, my phone's using that um, very much so. Um, what do you think about the new Ubuntu Um. I I don't know much about it. I believe it's it's mostly software. Do they have hardware behind it? Or their install, yeah. their install target at the moment is the Galaxy Nexus. Right. So they're yeah, installing. So yeah, I, I haven't really looked at it. Um, it's somebody else's phone project. This is my phone project. <laughs> you know? well, the problem also is I don't think they've actually released any source for it. So the only place people have actually seen the Ubuntu phone is either a P um, C S or on the videos that they've released. I contacted the Ubuntu guys to see if they were going to be, could send somebody here. It was probably a bit late for them to do that. And because it was only, a, they only announced it basically a month ago, so trying to organise somebody out here was a bridge too far. But they should be releasing more information soon. Hopefully they'll do better than their Ubuntu TV. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll just see how they go. I mean, they've already got that Ubuntu on Android 
set up where you can turn your Galaxy Nexus into a little desktop. Mm. That's cool. I wonder if anybody's told me that one. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. yes I have to look at the follow-up a little bit more after, but uh, obviously we're really seeing from four people who were in the survey project earlier wanting to get an Arduino on the way to play that essentially this is probably yeah. the, uh, the most likely easy part of doing that. Um, the Wi-Fi drive, can yeah. you tell me about it? How long? What chip did we have to start? Um, it's a uh, Libtas um, so YY or something. So the it, doesn't do access point mode at the moment. Though, well, there's a f there are two firmwares for it. There's a, a fairly heavyweight firmware that doesn't do access point mode and that's kind of supported and stuff. There's another thing called TF, thin firmware, that not very well supported. It does, ex but with it loaded, you can you need the Linux side to do almost all of the smarts, and so presumably you can do all sorts of stuff. Um, I don't know much about how open or how well supported it is. I did hear recently that. The, the Linux side of that, the patches exist somewhere, but they don't have the right signed off, so we don't actually know the copyright status of them sufficiently to include them in mainline. But that could probably be resolved if somebody cared enough. Um, I have occasionally used it in peer-to-peer um, -peer mode, ad hoc mode, yeah. Um, but mostly I just use it and it's a, bit, it's a bit slow I'm not sure why it's a bit slow again it's I've been focused on things that don't work at all more than things that work a little bit it, 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 it works well enough I mean it's, it's certainly faster to download the kernel through the USB 2 network yeah. than over the Wi-Fi network but apart from that I can't say much about again, it again just a mechanics cut things yeah. that don't work get the attention yeah. it just sort of do work and hang on yeah thanks Okay, um, any more questions? Alright, big thank you for now.